Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How Machine Learning Can Guide Protein Design. Our webinar today will be in English. Please mute yourself during the presentation. We'll be running a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions in the meantime, please send them into the chat box. In English or Chinese, I'll try to translate. And if you miss anything, don't worry, a recorded version will be available on BDBD. So first, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker, Tian Yu Lu, just finished his study in bioinformatics and computational biology at the University of Toronto, Canada. Tian Yu is also a junior scientist, a machine learning scientist in Protein Cure, co-president of iGEM Toronto, machine learning instructor in the Canadian Synthetic Biology Education Research Group. Tianyu is interested in machine learning for computational biology, in particular, generative models of protein sequence and structure applied to protein engineering, and exploring protein sequence, structure, and function. He has won many awards and grants, such as iGEM Gold Medal, um, National Biology Competition Top 1%, COVID-19 Student Engagement Grant, Dean Student Initiative Fund, and uh, Skill Endowment Fund, and so on. So Tianyu, thank you for being here today, and now the time is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tianyu, for the kind introduction and for the invitation. Um, thanks, everyone, for, I guess, listening to this talk in English, and thank you to the translator who uh, will translate this eventually. So today's talk is mostly going to be about uh, you know, what you can see here, how machine learning can guide protein design. Um, so hopefully this will be a sort of um, uh, overarching view, overarching view of this field, and I'll offer some thoughts I have on uh, you know this combination of machine learning and protein design, and hopefully this will be insightful to many of you. Okay. So the ultimate objective of protein design is to model this sort of landscape, a protein function landscape. So for example, here, you know, function, this word function can mean many things. It just is a, just a, de a desirable property. For example, it could be catalytic activity, thermal stability, uh, brightness of a fluorescent protein, binding affinity, solubility, all sorts of interesting things that you might care about as a protein engineer. So you know, this landscape here, is just for illustration, but you can imagine every point along this on this landscape is a protein sequence, and the height of that landscape is how much uh, how well it functions. So this is sort of like a regression task. For every sequence, I want to assign it a single number. Uh, for example, how bright that protein is. There's obviously other categories of functions, such as <clears throat> the location of a protein. And that's something discrete, but all today I'll just mainly focus on uh, regression tasks, but it's very general. Now, how do you infer function from sequence? Now, the traditional pipeline or the uh, paradigm of inferring function from sequence is you start from a sequence and then from it, it determines structure, right? This is the idea that sequence implies structure, which then implies function. Again, function can be arbitrary. So here I'm just showing, uh, for example, in this protein, this is pulsatile behavior in protein nuclear localization. All right, but again, very general idea of what function can be. In the machine learning world, and in fact, even back in the 60s when we were doing sequence alignments, you sort of treat structure as this unknown or latent variable, and instead just map the uh, model of function from sequence directly to function. Uh, function. How, how can we do this, right? A model needs to somehow take sequence as input and output the function. I'll mainly talk about uh, machine learning methods here, but there are, again, many other homology-based methods that people have used for many, many decades in the past. So how do we represent proteins on the computer? The simplest way is through one hot encoding which basically represents every amino acid as a unique integer. So it assigns every amino acid an index. Here's just the Python dictionaries that constructs these for you. 
So in this example, you have this six letter sequence MNFTRA, and you have a one at the index corresponding to that amino acid. So for example, the second row is corresponding to uh, N, right? So this is uh, the third index right here. And each row is a letter in the sequence. This is your input to the machine learning model, right? It's very, very simple and straightforward, uh, but it has its limitations. You realize it's very sparse, many zeros everywhere. And if you flatten this out, right, a normal machine learning model would just take this as this very flat vector as input. The other limitation is that some proteins become non-functional if you just change one residue, one amino acid. But homologous sequences can still fold and be functional even if you change maybe 50% of the sequence. But in one hot encoding, that information is not encoded. Right, something one residue away is a one distance away in this one hot encoding representation. But something, you know, half of the residue is being mutated, that's gonna be 50% of, of this, it's gonna be a very large um, distance, input distance. So one way we can sort of try to incorporate some of that knowledge over protein sequences such as homology is using these pre-trained embeddings. So here is the general setup. You have an input sequence that you feed into this neural network called an embedder. And the embedder returns to you this thing called an embedding vector. This is a continuous vector of fixed dimension in some embedding vector space, right? This very abstract and very large space, usually could be thousands of dimensions. Um, but what is useful about this embedding vector then? This can be then used as an input to a simple top model, such as linear regression or k-nearest neighbors. Using this as input instead of those one hot encodings, you can then predict protein function. And something important for machine learning is that you need to predict function on a held out set. Um, so those unseen sequences to probe how well your model generalizes to unseen sequences. Now here, I'm just doing a random shuffle between your, my data and testing it on this random subset. However, you could be more nuanced about what your test set is, especially for protein design. For example, how well generalizes to unseen position variations or generalization to sequences with property values not seen in the range of the training data. But there are so many possible ways you could stratify your test set. Um, I encourage those who are interested to, to really think about, you know, test splits that are not just random. But that's another story. We'll continue talking about sequence embedders. Now, the main point is that they are pre-trained without labels on large sequence databases. Um, you'll recognize here that the training data I'm just listing three examples of sequence embedders here. They're pre-trained on millions to billions of protein sequences. Here's their embedding dimension. So this one is uh, 1024 dimensional. And you know these are all different in terms of their embedding dimension and also their pre-training task. You also realize they have millions to hundreds of millions of parameters. Right? So what is the intuition? Why do we need to do pre-training on this? And what do you get out of it? The goal is that the embedding vectors that it uh, generates can be used for a variety of downstream tasks. Right here, I'm just listing um, a few examples, but you could imagine that there's many, many more things that you would care about and that you can just directly use these embedding vectors for. There's a very powerful way of representing protein sequences. And just to solidify and visualize some of the intuition we have, it indeed clusters similar and homologous sequences together. So here I'm plotting a 2D uh, TSNI plot of the protbert embeddings, which are in 1024 dimensions, 
GFP and RFP, right, these are both fluorescent proteins. You can see a very nice cluster of these two together. Petase and LCC, they also tend to cluster together. So it confirms your intuition that homologous sequences, even though, by the way, these two have maybe 40% sequence identity, and these, these ones have about 48%, um, they do tend to cluster together. Okay, how are these trained? Like what is this pre mysterious pre-training task? Some of these models are pre-trained autoregressively. Basically, you start from methionine, for example, right? This, a start token, and then you predict the probability of the next amino acid. And then you decode by sampling from a distribution like this, right? You sample from this multinomial, you pick some residue, for example, here, serine, and then you decode, which is say, okay, the next residue should be a serine. And you basically generate one amino acid at a time from left to right, sort of like sentence generation. This is sort of um, unrealistic, right, for proteins, even though they're synthesized on the ribosome from left to right, the identity of amino acid depends on things, you know, both from its left, but maybe also to its right. So there's another pre-training task, which is bi-directional pre-training. And instead of just looking at residues on the left, it also looks at residues to the right. And it conditions on the identities of those, and it predicts the masked uh, amino acid here in the middle. So again, to, use, to sample from this is a bit more tricky. Uh, it's no longer left to right, because now you have things coming from both directions. So what you could do with this is something called Gibbs sampling, uh, where you just basically mask out random tokens and then you generate those sort of stochastically. All right, but it's the same idea. You're still defining a probability distribution over your amino acids conditioned on the rest of the sequence. All right, the third type or one of the other types of pre-training is structure-based. And this is really interesting because it respects the structure of protein um, of proteins. So this is also quite intuitive because the identity of amino acid that goes here, right? What residue should go here intuitively just depends on its local amino acid environment. And basically the model gets to see, oh, here we have PRAQMR in this environment conditioned on the identities of those residues what are the probabilities of a residue here? And that's a structure-based pre-training task. Okay. Now, actually what I've just talked about was uh, methods of training generative models, right? It's no longer just saying, oh, predict sequence to function directly, like training some linear like a regression model. It's now thinking about this um, these arrows sort of in the reverse direction, right? Before you had sequence to structure and structure to function. Now you have sort of these arrows going reverse. Now this is really where design comes in. So what this is saying, or this first arrow is saying, given some structure, so the backbone uh, of, for example, the, the C alpha geometry, what sequences, the, let's find the probability distribution of sequences that can accommodate and fold into that structure. Similarly for these other arrows as well, given function, what is my structure? Um, and then the really interesting one that I'm gonna talk about today is given function, what is sequence? This is a very powerful idea of thinking about design. Essentially it's saying, I wanna condition protein sequence space. I wanna find the distribution of sequences such that it satisfies some desired function, right? It's very abstract, but hopefully some of these next slides will clarify these points. So generative models. In general, okay, what are these generative models? It's basically P of X, where X can be anything. So in the previous slide, you've seen X being sequences or structures or even function. And the power of specifying P of X, in this case, parameterization just means uh, training a neural network, for example, to encode this, this, this object here. 
if you think about like a um, like a one D Gaussian, the parameters are the mean and variance, right? Mu and sigma. But for more complicated distributions, um, perhaps the parameters are just the weights of your neural network. And then the output of this thing is just a single number between zero and one. It assigns a probability to each of your input examples. By its name, generative models is able to generate new examples. So if you were to do one on sequences, you just sample from it and generate new sequences. It can also compute likelihoods. This is the P of X thing, right? What is the probability or what is the likelihood of some given example X? So what is the power of both of these things? Well, let's talk about likelihoods. So in the figure below, you see this difference between on the left, a discriminative model that explicitly separates out the two classes, blue and red, whereas a generative model doesn't have that boundary, but instead models the generative distribution that sort of generates um, the, each of these distributions. So you have this blue, um, blue area here, let's say maybe this is a 2D Gaussian, this one generates our blue examples. And then the red surface here generates our red examples. So for each of these uh, curves, you can compute P of X. So if you can think about, well, for example, the blue, blue ones here are functional sequences. And the red ones here are detrimental or toxic sequences that you don't want. Suppose you have accurate generative models for these. You would just compute P of X under this compute P of X under the red one. And if your sequence was indeed functional, ideally it should have high likelihood under the blue distribution and low likelihood under the red distribution. So this is how you can use generative models as discriminative models or to make inference on protein function, right? But what about the sampling thing? Sampling is also very useful because protein sequence space is vast, right? you can have, this is combinatorial, every position 20 possibilities, average length protein possibilities explodes. Um, and here's just some interesting numbers that I heard from one of the talks that Christopher Ball gave, that if you were to imagine all computers being individual atoms in the universe, every atom doing compute 10 to the 16 flops and all of the atoms have been doing compute since the beginning of time, you multiply these three numbers together and you would only have explored a tiny fraction of sequence space. So the power of generative models is that it allows you to focus your search on promising regions of sequence space. And so you can think about this as in terms of if you had 1 billion possible designs, you can just screen them through a generative model, right? Or even better, you simply sample, maybe not 1 billion designs, you sample maybe a couple hundred from your generative model. And ideally those samples have high likelihood and thus they will be likely to function in, in, in the lab. You can also think about protein confirmation space and you can define uh, generative models over this space as well. It's, it's quite exciting um, to think about this because you can have a distribution over backbones, which you see on the left. It's similar structures, right? You can both, visually you can pick out some similarities, these alpha helices and sandwiching these beta sheets. Um, on the right is sort of a distribution over internal angles or coordinates of a protein. So I'm doing MD simulation on this protein right here and you can see basically distributions of how the side chains and how the backbones move, uh, at least locally. So again, why generative models? I wanna sort of pinpoint this sort of with the idea that it allows conditioning and that's really powerful, right? So what is conditioning? Uh, this is uh, rotomer angles. So the rotomers are like the, the rotations of the side chain, right? The dihedral angles of side chains of, of your residues. And this is one particular rotomer angle. Now, 
this is conditioned on phi psi, which are the backbone dihedral angles. So dependent on where this red dot is, that's the value of phi psi. Based on that value, dependent on that, you have differences in likelihoods over the possibilities of your rotamers, right? In some values of phi psi, certain rotamers are more likely than others. And this is the power of conditioning. And this is a probability distribution, right? This was obtained from sequence, uh, from structure statistics in the PDB. Uh, you can see some more interesting animations on in the Dumbrack Lab website. But this is really what, what it's doing. You're conditioning, these are these backbone dependent rotamer um, angles. And it can be used for sidechain repacking. Some other diverse applications, sequence design. So this is Bayes' rule, but written in terms of sequence and structure. So what is going on here is saying, given a structure, find those sequences, right? That can accommodate that structure. Rewrite it using Bayes' rule. And this is the first term right here is a uh, sequence to structure model, essentially um, protein structure prediction. The second term, P sequence, well, that was one of our pre-trained generative models. Um, those very large pre-trained generative models is P sequence because you're training on essentially all known protein sequences, at least for the case of ProBERT. Um, this is essentially the distribution you're modeling. Um, and then P structure in this case is a fixed backbone, so it's constant. So definitely look at uh, this paper for more details, very interesting stuff. Another interesting example is uh, what they call protein hallucination, where basically you drop this denominator here. And what you're doing is actually they're able to sample from this joint distribution. And again, using these building blocks, sequence to structure, somehow then also be able to use this to generate new combinations of sequence and structure. It's very, very interesting how they did this. So uh, a very nice paper to read. So thinking about generative models in this way, like P sequence given function, P function and whatever, sort of uh, removes you from the specific architectures and methods of actually training these generative models. But I do wanna point out that all of these types of generative models in mainstream machine learning have been already applied to protein design or protein modeling in actually just the last few years. Uh, some of these ones like energy-based models, they were uh, around a bit earlier, but these other ones really just the last few years um, have saw this huge growth in application to protein modeling. But you know, it's nice talking about models and everything. What about the training data, right? This is really what shapes your generative model. That's the distribution of sequences or structures that you're modeling. So let's think about the <clears throat> common case where you would like to engineer, for example, an enzyme that has some particular function. Now, this is really the limitation of machine learning now is that you need data um, to train these things. And usually you have to rely on evolution to provide you that data. So for example, here on the right, top right, I'm showing two structures which have diverged pretty much um, in sequence. They're about 48% similar, but their structures are strikingly preserved, especially the active site. But this information is obtained from evolution. Same thing as this multiple sequence alignment down here, right? Where residues are conserved that's all given to you for free, essentially, by evolution and the very kind curators of these sequences and the BLAST database or, or the BLAST algorithm. So one way you can construct these data sets is do position a specific iterated BLAST. So you construct this profile of your amino acids starting from some query sequence. Again, that's a limitation. You need some starting point with these ML methods, uh, which is unlike you know, the novel design where maybe you don't really need that starting point or training data. 
But for this one, you do need a starting point, maybe an enzyme that works half decently that you want to improve the efficiency of. And then you just search a database for that. And the attempt is to obtain homologous sequences and tell the model which positions should be conserved and which positions perhaps there could be some variations. So embedded in this data set are statistics that tell you how conserved um, uh, certain columns are, but also certain pairs of columns, which I'll talk about next few slides. Uh, for some interesting, or for the details on how you construct this, see this paper um, by Russ and others. Now, this is just one way, by the way, of constructing a data set. Many other ways exist out there, but this is a, I, I believe this is sort of an un, um, under, uh, underappreciated problem in protein models is how do you actually curate uh, this data? And you know, what data you train on really matters because that's all, that's the generative distribution you're training on. Okay, well, now back to talking about models. Um, the first thing is the POTS model, which actually was developed in 1962. Uh, this has then been repurposed to, to proteins where this is an energy-based model, right? So that, okay, there's a lot of symbols, but it's the probability of a sequence is proportional to e to the energy. And I may be missing some negative signs here, but essentially <clears throat> you have these two terms. Fields, which tells you site-wise conservation. And this is really a matrix, right? This parameter h is a matrix that is of dimension L by 21, we're saying for every position L in the sequence, what are the, prob prob uh, what are the probabilities over my 21 um, characters? So 20 amino acids plus one gap character in the alignment. That's, this is the site-wise uh, conservation. And then you have pairwise conservation, which is essentially for every pair of positions, IJ, let's say, in this case, I'm looking at the position six, position three. So for this pair of positions, let's encode the probabilities of every pair of amino acids. So in this pair of positions, let's say, well, what is the probability of both alanines being here? Or one is a glycine and one is a, one is a serine, for example, and then encodes this explicitly right, in these very, very large uh, matrices. So let's talk about these couplings a bit more. It's pretty interesting. So this is, has something to do with coevolution. Coevolution is this idea of when you have pairs of columns that tend to evolve together. And as this very simple example, you can see glycine and alanine in these two columns. But when glycine mutates to alanine in this sequence, you have this corresponding mutation in this other, in this other sequence here, in this other uh, position here. So there is some correlation along those two columns. And the intuition is that this is a, 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 this is a product, a result of two residues being close together in structure. If they're close together in structure, they have to sort of co-evolve because they need to accommodate each other in terms of charge hydrophobicity and all that stuff. So this can, you know, from this signal then, you can then use to infer structure. And that was like the basis of some of these structure prediction, prediction methods. But these are, this POTS model right here, you can sample from this, right? Because you can compute a probability of a sequence, of any sequence and generate new proteins. And that's what uh, Russ and others did. And they got some very interesting results. So that's also a very interesting paper to read. Now back to this slide, right? Conditioning methods convey a modeler's inductive bias. Okay, inductive bias here, I guess in my view, sort of says, well, what should the model think that proteins should function? So for example, in this way of conditioning, generative models, right? By the way, these three types of training, autoregressive, bidirectional, and structure-based, 
are all ways of training generative models. It's masking out certain amino acids and the model is asked to recover and predict what was masked out. In that sense, it's modeling p-sequence. Um, and in this case, probably it's p-sequence given structure. Essentially, it's trying to model this, this na native distribution that's observed in nature. Um, or you know, by specifying your data sets in a clever way, it could model your distribution of interest. Um, but this is the objective of these generative model pre-training tasks. For example, the structure base is saying, I want to train the model by allowing it to look at the local amino acid environment and using that predict what should be in the center of that environment. And that's the general idea of why these generative models might work. It's essentially recovering sequence statistics or in the structure-based model, sequence statistics conditioned on structure. Okay. You can also condition on domain expertise. Uh, what this means is if you have an enzyme that you know the active site of, you can just say, well, let's not change these residue positions. Of course, this is, um, this is like Rosetta Design 101. In the res file, you can specify this already. And you can even be more sophisticated in the res file with the geometries of the proteins. But generative modeling with machine learning is slowly catching up. You can have essentially sampling where you condition on, for example, we have to have a histidine at position 209 and allow the model to sample all the other positions. Okay, so now you have the training data for a generative model. How do we actually design sequences? The definition of design is that you need to, um, you need to construct some protein with properties that were not observed in, um, that are already not observed in your training data. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to do the design, right? So if you were to just sample from that MSA that you, were, that you constructed, that's just like natural proteins that already exist. What if you wanna optimize some properties? So sure, you have some generative model that generates sequences, but what you can do is this thing called adaptive sampling. What that is, is you score the generated sequences through the sequence to function neural network or some model that doesn't have to be a neural network. Uh, in this case, it just happens to be one. But this gives you uh, a number for each sequence. For example, how bright that fluorescent protein is. And that's gonna give you some distribution. So each of these points here on the x-axis is gonna be some sequence. And you have a distribution of over the brightness. What you do then is condition on the optimal sequences. So on those sequences that are predicted to be optimal, if you're maximizing something, you would take, for example, this area here. And those sequences will then become part of your training set of your generative model. This is an iterative procedure. You iterate this such that every iteration you're training on more and more optimal sequences down here. That's the big, that's the high level idea of what this conditioning by adaptive sampling means. So there is going to be some math, but uh, I might just go over the first two slides and jump to some of the uh, later slides. It might be a bit dense, um, but definitely read this paper. It's a very interesting paper and it has lots of potential, I think, for design in general. So they encode a protein using one hot encoding. And the goal is to model this distribution. It's a distribution of sequences X conditioned on some desired set of properties S and theta, which are the parameters of your initial generative model, right? Trained on, for example, an MSA. This is using Bayes rule with some additional assumptions about conditional independence. But after you derive this, you can look at these two parts Right, there's one here and there's one here. So that second part is a generator, right? It, sampling from this gives you new sequences X. And the first part, this one right here, P of S given X 
is an oracle. In other words, it's a sequence to function model. Given some sequence X, look at the probability of that sequence satisfying some desired properties in my desired set. Okay. In fact, this distribution is difficult to model because of this denominator. This denominator is saying, let's take the sum over all the X's. And the X represents a sequence, a protein sequence. So it's saying, okay, let's sum over in the entire protein sequence space. That's not possible, or it's intractable, that's the term they use. So instead we use a variational approach. Um, this, is their, this is how they derive their objective, but intuitively what's saying is instead of just modeling this thing straight up, let's model Q, which is some other search distribution. And you want Q to match P as closely as possible by minimizing this thing here called the KL divergence. If you minimize the two, you're sort of minimizing, you're sort of making uh, P and Q very similar distributions, hopefully. So Q has these parameters phi, and these phi parameters are what you want to learn now. Um, and this is going to be your final generative model. From then you can do sampling and generate new sequences. So after you uh, expand that term, this is what you get. And the objective is actually to maximize this term, this expectation. Okay, so in, what is this doing? And what is the problem with this equation or with this expression? It's saying you sample from your initial generative model, P of X, and then you compute this thing. The first term is the problem because for many instances of sequences X, it might not satisfy your function. And in fact, if it's a rare property that you're screening for, this thing is gonna be near zero for most of the times you're sampling. So that's a big problem. You have basically defeated the whole point of generative models is that you can you have to maybe generate 1 billion sequences before you find something that satisfies uh, this function. So what you can do then is to do important sampling by defining another distribution R from which you take samples. And then ideally that will no longer make this term near zero most of the time. So essentially you're only sampling those things that are important and contribute to this term in, in the middle here. But this big equation or this big uh, expression that you wanna maximize has some very interesting and intuitive properties. You have this term called the prior. This is your initial generative model. This is your uh, distribution of sequences that you know already work. Um, that's your training data. This is your sequence generator Q, all right? And this is your Oracle. When you wanna maximize this thing, what you're essentially doing is you wanna maximize all three of these terms. So importantly, well, clearly you wanna maximize this thing because you want your sequence to have high good uh, and high and good function. Interestingly, you also wanna maximize probability under the prior. <clears throat> What that means is your sequence should be likely under your initial distribution as well. And that's really interesting because it accounts for the possibility that if you add too many mutations, it might just go, you know, your Oracle might just go out, outside its training regime and uh, you, know, you can have these um, pathological behaviors of sequence to function models where you know, in, you input some nonsensical sequence and it's gonna predict that this sequence is super good. This is sort of trying to countervent, uh, inter, intervene with that, is to say that, well, it not only needs to be high functioning under my Oracle, it should also be likely in terms of protein sequence space, right? At least what the sequences I've seen in my prior knowledge of what sequences look like. Again, this is very, very general. X doesn't have to be a protein sequence. It could be a small molecule. It could be a peptide. 
It could be the material composition in superconductors. Very, very general setup. And it's very interesting to, to read that paper. Um, I will skip some of these slides, but you can take a look at these on your own time. I do want to show you some of these uh, other results that how machine learning can help protein design. And this is some very interesting stuff that connects with uh, structures. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk about massive search, which is uh, molecular surface interaction fingerprints. Very interesting idea here. Now, instead of encoding a sequence as an embedding vector, right? You know, that was the whole idea of embeddings in the, like the second slide or something. Now you're encoding surfaces as vectors. So these patches on proteins of surfaces encoded as a vector. So each of these black dots is going to be some vector in your feature space or in your, uh, in, in your vector space. The usefulness of doing this is that it can capture these not just sequence properties anymore. It will, cap it will capture geometric properties like curvature, um, hydropathy, electrostatics, uh, electrons, and so on. Right, And it does this through these um, geodesic uh, convolutions, which you can read in uh, Gainza and others in this paper that they wrote for Massive. So really, in the end, they call this the fingerprint, right? This is really the embedding vector for every patch on the protein surface. Then this fingerprint can then be used for downstream tasks. This is a very general setup. Before, it was sequences to vectors and then used for downstream tasks. Now it's surfaces to vectors, now to downstream tasks. This enables some very interesting applications. For example, you can compute the surfaces uh, of DNA structures, right? You're not limited to protein structures. DNAs have structures too. They have charge, electrostatics, hydropathy, et cetera. You compute these features. And for example, I want to look at these white patches here. Perhaps I want to look at proteins with similar properties, with similar curvature and similar electron distributions. So I can actually run this by computing those vectors on the whole PDB, really, and comparing these vectors in, in terms of Euclidean distance. The closer two vectors are, the more similar these surfaces are intuitively. So you can see some of the results returned by this procedure. And you can see, well, just visually, I guess there's some nice curvature here that sort of mimic DNA. And this one right here is flanked by red residues, which are those negatively charged uh, residues that sort of mimic the phosphate backbone of DNA. So this really enables, if, if you want to have like an interesting surface you want to search for in the PDB, you can do a surface search. Um, you could even do design, but, but, but so far that application hasn't surfaced yet in the literature. Okay, so that's my 40 minutes. If uh, I would like to thank many people um, for you know, collaborators and uh, mentors to contribute to this talk. And also importantly, I list some resources here that if you wanna stay in touch with the protein engineering community, these are very useful resources. Um, in particular, Twitter, um, lots of people are on there and Kevin Yang's GitHub. This contains a lot of papers in this related field that will give you a very nice starting point. Interestingly, in just the last couple of weeks, many people have actually released reviews on uh, proteins and machine learning. And you can take a look at some of these um, down here. If you wanna look at the code um, to train like basic machine learning models like discriminative models to predict function from sequence, generative models to generate new sequences and so on, um, I've got this uh, protein design repo as, that I did in part of CSBerg, which has at least six notebooks. And each notebook gives you instructions on how to train models and it's sort of step-by-step -step instructions along the way.
and definitely feel free to reach me, uh, reach out to me via email. And yeah, I guess any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much you for the amazing talk. So I'm not sure if it's because of the language problem so far. We don't have any questions in the chat box. And I personally have two, three questions. So maybe I can start and the others can follow. So the first problem, I'm not sure if I missed that. So um, on page 22, mm -hmm. um, you said we can, for example, generate sequences and then you can also check the probability of the brightness of fluorescence and uh, where are the original sequences from? Right. Um... But is this the slide you're mentioning? Oh, yes. OK. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So at least when I apply this method to designing enzymes, the, the first sort of naive application is you can train your model on data that was like has experimental labels for. So for an example, GFP, you have this data set of about like 52,000 um, different GFP sequences that for each one, they've measured the uh, fluorescence of the brightness for. So that's like a data set that someone has generously created and put on the internet. That's the kind of data set you could train this on. Um, is with every sequence you have a label and that's the data you can train this model on. I guess you can also train uh, the generative model on, on that distribution as well. That could be a starting point. That could be interesting for sure. Um, but I guess in terms of the generative model, you have more flexibility on your training data, like where you get those sequences. Um, because it doesn't, your sequences for generative models don't have to be labeled. Like you don't need to do experiments to say what's the brightness of the sequence. It could just be an existing sequence in nature, and that's all you need. Uh, but for this gener for this um, scoring model here, you need the sequence to function pairs. Uh, you need some measurement for every sequence. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And the second question is maybe can you see uh, a little bit more about um, how you can get a very novel protein uh, if you train on the existing real protein database. Yeah, that's really interesting. So let's see. Well, actually, so it's an interesting idea with generative models. For example, like this POTS model here, uh, when, when these people did it uh, in this in their paper, they were able to get pretty novel sequences. And I think it's just a property of generative models that when you sort of sample from them, it, it, I mean, it depends on how much you train your generative model. Of course, you can overfit um, your model training and it might just generate you know, not novel sequences. It's just the same sequence that's observed in the training set. So you can control how much you train your generative model um, by essentially rem like holding out some sequences and not, not letting the model see those sequences then evaluating the probability, the likelihood of those held out sequences under your trained model. So that's like saying the model, yes, has good likelihoods on your training data, mm -hmm. but it should also have good likelihoods on these unseen data points, which are gonna be novel. So that's the way you can sort of try to implicitly control like um, the, the degree of novelty of your, of your generations. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, I have one more question. So I think the uh, idea to design a protein giving a structure or giving a function, it's very, very powerful. We can do a lot of things with that. Um, so I can think of maybe you can design a antibody maybe. So mm -hmm. you want to have a specific structure and you want to generate a sequence. Or um, like you said, the conditioning on domain, for example, with this, maybe you can increase the 
efficiency of some enzymes or something. Uh, mm -hmm. And can you maybe tell us more about the application of this protein design? Yeah, for sure. So Thanks. in terms of this, um, at least so the applications that I've worked on mm -hmm. is the second example you gave, which was to optimize some enzymes catalytic uh, efficiency. And you can, and other applications, you can also optimize its uh, thermal stability. So you can increase, try to increase the temperature at which it can function. And so that, I think those things have been done. Um, there are some like proof of concepts, but that's the, um, that's the area that I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, there's actually an example in one of those later slides about uh, structure to sequence. Um, so I guess, you know, Rosetta sort of already does this stuff, right? You, you have a structure and you can do Rosetta design and give the sequence um, and the structure can be anything. But um, for example, in the case of, let's say antibodies, mm -hmm. you could even design the structure. Um, for example, and this is one of the examples that sort of design these um, complementary loops using this IgVAE, immunoglobulin VAE. And what they do is like they, they have these restraints in sort of backbone geometry. And they basically want to design a backbone that can satisfy these distance constraints. Yeah. And then, well, this is obtained by looking at this binding surface and trying to get a shape that will be complementary to the binding surface. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is one of the applications. I'm, I'm not sure if they synthesize these in the lab, but I guess that's one of the places where I guess the field is heading now is mm -hmm. right now it's a lot of different methods and tools and models and sort of a lack of experimental uh, validation. So yeah, there are a couple papers out there. For example, Brian He has a paper on designing uh, small molecules. Well, this is not, I guess, this is not protein related, but is using these embedding ideas as well. It's like designing small molecules to bind to kinases. Mm -hmm. So yeah, many examples currently out there. I mean, I guess they've designed anti-cancer peptides, antimicrobial peptides, um, like way back in 2018 mm -hmm. with some of these generative models. Um, there are some interesting papers like on how they do, did that training as well. And I think that one had experimental validation. Um, they were able to show that those generated peptides were indeed um, antimicrobial. So yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> you just remind me that, um, so, Normally, if you don't validate, how do you know that the designed sequence can really have this structure? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, you know, with this uh, with this stuff here, like uh, where is it? It's uh, yeah, like p sequence given structure. Mm -hmm. um, so. Obviously, like, it would be difficult if you had to validate by determining the structure of all the sequences you design. That's gonna be very expensive. So that's I don't I don't think people have done that. It's just they're using these computational proxies um, to sort of try to assess how good it is by essentially it's like the same idea. You're holding out certain examples as, mm -hmm. as part of a validation set or a test set, and you're only training it on a particular set of structures. Okay. Um, and then you say, oh, okay, let's look at the likelihood of a sequence given structure for this held out, um, held out protein. It's sort of like, they're sort of benchmarking on native sequence recovery, mm -hmm. which is like in the known examples, like for example, like this structure here, you know that's the structure. Yeah. And you know that's the sequence that can fold into that structure. Mm -hmm. So the, I guess the metric they measure is how well the model can recover mm -hmm. those, one, the, those native, those wild type amino acids. Mm 
on this in this structure mm -hmm. um, because this is the correct structure and yeah. the and the better that the better the model reconstructs those native amino acids I guess that's the way they say that their model is better than some other model um, of course yeah uh, you definitely need some experimental validation but like those are pretty expensive at this point <laughs> Maybe in the future, um, structure determination will change, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I see uh, we have some questions coming in. Uh, now we can uh, maybe check some questions here in the chat box. And the first one is, um, the protein design is usually considered as the inverse problem of protein structure prediction. Can the protein design benefit from the great success of AlphaFold 2 in protein structure prediction? Yeah, that's a really good point. So yeah, for example, here, this arrow is, I guess, the classical protein design, right? From structure to sequence. Yeah. It's like the arrow is going the other way instead of going, the, uh, going from left to right. And actually on this slide, uh, let's maybe just delete or, yeah, sorry about this uh, weird layering here, but it's this middle or these two equations that I guess kind of answer your question. So this thing right here, P structure given sequence, that's for example, alpha fold two, that's what it does. Like from a sequence predict the structure. So this is actually like a building block then in this equation. It's like this first term in this equation. And then you can, you know, come up with some P sequence and come up with P structure. And this is what you get from Bayes rule. This is the protein design problem that, that you care about, right? Given some structure, look at the sequence, design those sequences that fit onto that structure. So yeah, we can indeed use a structure prediction tool like AlphaFold2 as perhaps a more accurate term for P structure given sequence. Um, I don't think people have tried it yet. I mean, this, this equation here, people, so Nora and others, they use this thing called TR Rosetta, which is also this uh, structure prediction tool. Uh, but yeah, it would be interesting to try if, um, if you can get your hands on alpha fold two. <laughs> yeah, that's an important point. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. So the next question is a layman question. How people present protein functions in models? Yes. Um, yeah, so protein function is sort of like a very general idea. So it's kind of difficult to explain well. Um, I guess, what do you mean by uh, predict, uh, presenting function in models? I guess. I guess to the model, what it sees in terms of, let's say the brightness of, of a protein is, or the brightness of GFP or something, is just a number. So that's just the, how the model sees protein function as like maybe like 2.5. <laughs> that's the function of a protein. Um, yeah, if you want proteins that have like discrete functions, like whether or not it's a binder. So it either is a binder or is not a binder that's like a zero or one. That's how the model sees it. It's kind of weird. Like the model doesn't know about anything about binding, at least if you don't give it the structure. All it knows is whether or not to predict a zero or one for an input sequence. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Hopefully. I, I hope so. <laughs> Christy, I don't think it's a layman question. I don't know this either. <laughs> I think people from this field I mean, they know, but other people don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So Christy wrote, yes, thanks. <laughs> okay. And the last question in the chat box is, um, as you have mentioned, the one hot encode data of protein sequence is very sparse. How do you deal with this sparse data? Thanks. Yeah. Great question. So, well, the naive way is not to deal with it. <laughs> it's just to throw it at a model and see what it can do with it. Um, basically, you, I mean, just spread this vector out in this very long, like spread this matrix out into this, flatten it into this very long vector. Um, and then that's just the raw input. 
to a machine learning model. And actually, in some cases, it does fairly well. Like you don't need to even worry that this is very sparse. Um, and I guess the, the embeddings, that's sort of how you could deal with the, the sparsity because then you're essentially turning a sequence into this information rich vector that ideally should be better um, than if you were to just use a one hot encoding. Um, I mean, yeah, so sparsity here it's not too big a problem. Um, I mean, the case with even with these embedders here, they're like you somehow still need to input the sequence into the embedder. And that part is done with one hot encoding. So unless, I mean, unless you have different representations of amino acids that sort of at the chemical level, that's not just like one of 20 characters, that's more of like, oh, let's look at actually the, the chemical graph of you know, a phenylalanine has this ring at the end. Mm -hmm. So if you actually look at those and maybe the biophysical properties of those, then they will no longer be sparse. Um, it's, then it's not gonna be like, it's a phenylalanine, a one there and zero everywhere else. So hopefully, yeah, I, I haven't seen many uh, inputs. I mean, there are people sort of using that, but I think those papers were like in the 1980s um, where they were using like, you know, size and charge of amino acids as the input to some actually artificial neural network in the 1980s. And then they were actually trying to predict, predict function all the way back then. So, um, yeah, I mean, not limited to one hot encoding, but I mean, this works, if it works, then it's good. It's a simple baseline. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So. Now we don't have any questions in the chat box so far. And uh, yeah, Christy, uh, so I hope you will, <laughs> you will be here next time uh, to give us a talk <laughs> if you, Christy is still here. And um, so thank you again, Tian Yu. I'm sure everyone has now far more understanding of the topic. And I really enjoyed your, uh, your explains uh, about the, the mathematic formulas because I never tried to understand them I just use them, but I never really maybe understand the math behind some models. Yeah, thanks for that. And once again, thank you all for taking time and being here today. And um, have a nice day or evening. And thank you, Tianyu, again for being here. And um, I will see you guys next week.